Hipparchus of Nicaea was a Greek astronomer, geographer, and mathematician. He is considered the founder of trigonometry but is most famous for his incidental discovery of precession of the equinoxes. Hipparchus was born in Nicaea, Bithynia, now is Nick, Turkey, and probably died on the island of Rhodes. He is known to have been a working astronomer at least from 162 to 127. Hipparchus is considered the greatest ancient astronomical observer and, by some, the greatest overall astronomer of antiquity. He was the first whose quantitative and accurate models for the motion of the Sun and Moon survive. For this he certainly made use of the observations and perhaps the mathematical techniques accumulated over centuries by the Babylonians and other people from Mesopotamia. He developed trigonometry and constructed trigonometric tables, and he solved several problems of spherical trigonometry. With his solar and lunar theories and his trigonometry, he may have been the first to develop a reliable method to predict solar eclipses. His other reputed achievements include the discovery and measurement of Earth's precession, the compilation of the first comprehensive star catalogue of the Western world, and possibly the invention of the astrolabe, also of the armillary sphere, which he used during the creation of much of the star catalogue. Life and Work Relatively little of Hipparchus's direct work survives into modern times. Although he wrote at least 14 books, only his commentary on the popular astronomical poem by Aratus was preserved by later copyists. Most of what is known about Hipparchus comes from Strabo's Geography and Pliny's Natural History in the 1st century, Ptolemy's 2nd century Almagest, and additional references to him in the 4th century by Pappus of Alexandria and Theon of Alexandria in their commentaries on the Almagest. There is a strong tradition that Hipparchus was born in Nicaea, in the ancient district of Bithynia, modern day Iznik in province Bursa, in what today is the country Turkey. The exact dates of his life are not known, but Ptolemy attributes to him astronomical observations in the period from 147-127, and some of these are stated as made in Rhodes, earlier observations since 162 might also have been made by him. His birth date, was calculated by de Lambre based on clues in his work. Hipparchus must have lived some time after 127 because he analyzed and published his observations from that year. Hipparchus obtained information from Alexandria as well as Babylon, but it is not known when or if he visited these places. He is believed to have died on the island of Rhodes, where he seems to have spent most of his later life. It is not known what Hipparchus's economic means were nor how he supported his scientific activities. His appearance is likewise unknown, there are no contemporary portraits. In the 2nd and 3rd centuries coins were made in his honour in Bithynia that bear his name and show him with a globe, this supports the tradition that he was born there. Hipparchus is thought to be the first to calculate a heliocentric system, but he abandoned his work because the calculations showed the orbits were not perfectly circular as believed to be mandatory by the science of the time. As an astronomer of antiquity his influence, supported by ideas from Aristotle, held sway for nearly 2,000 years, until the heliocentric model of Copernicus. Hipparchus's only preserved work is Tau Nu Rho Tau Omicron Upsilon Kappa Alpha Epsilon Delta Xi Omicron Upsilon Phi Alpha Iota Nu Omicron Mu Nu Omega Nu Xi Gamma Eta Sigma Iota, Commentary on the Phenomena of Eudacus and Aratus. This is a highly critical commentary in the form of two books on a popular poem by Aratus based on the work by Eudacus. Hipparchus also made a list of his major works, which apparently mentioned about 14 books, but which is only known from references by later authors. His famous star catalogue was incorporated into the one by Ptolemy, and may be almost perfectly reconstructed by subtraction of two and two-thirds degrees from the longitudes of Ptolemy's stars. The first trigonometric table was apparently compiled by Hipparchus, who is now consequently known as the father of trigonometry. Modern Speculation Hipparchus was in the international news in 2005, when it was again proposed, as in 1898, that the data on the celestial globe of Hipparchus or in his star catalogue may have been preserved in the only surviving large ancient celestial globe which depicts the constellations with moderate accuracy the globe carried by the Farnese Atlas. There are a variety of missteps in the more ambitious 2005 paper, 
thus no specialists in the area accept its widely publicized speculation. Lucio Russo has said that Plutarch, in his work on the face in the moon, was reporting some physical theories that we consider to be Newtonian and that these may have come originally from Hipparchus, he goes on to say that Newton may have been influenced by them. According to one book review, both of these claims have been rejected by other scholars. A line in Plutarch's table talk states that Hipparchus counted 103,049 compound propositions that can be formed from 10 simple propositions. 103,049 is the tenth Schroeder Hipparchus number, which counts the number of ways of adding one or more pairs of parentheses around consecutive subsequences of two or more items in any sequence of 10 symbols. This has led to speculation that Hipparchus knew about enumerative combinatorics, a field of mathematics that developed independently in modern mathematics. Babylonian Sources Earlier Greek astronomers and mathematicians were influenced by Babylonian astronomy to some extent, for instance the period relations of the Metonic cycle and Saros cycle may have come from Babylonian sources, see Babylonian astronomical diaries. Hipparchus seems to have been the first to exploit Babylonian astronomical knowledge and techniques systematically. Except for Timocharis and Aristilus, he was the first Greek known to divide the circle in 360 degrees of 60 arc minutes, Eratosthenes before him used a simpler sexagesimal system dividing a circle into 60 parts. He also used the Babylonian unit Pechus, cubit, of about 2 degrees or 2.5 degrees. Hipparchus probably compiled a list of Babylonian astronomical observations, G.J. Toomer, a historian of astronomy has suggested that Ptolemy's knowledge of eclipse records and other Babylonian observations in the Almagest came from a list made by Hipparchus. Hipparchus's use of Babylonian sources has always been known in a general way, because of Ptolemy's statements. However, Franz Xaver Kugler demonstrated that the synodic and anomalistic periods that Ptolemy attributes to Hipparchus had already been used in Babylonian ephemerides, specifically the collection of texts nowadays called System B sometimes attributed to Kaidanu. Hipparchus's long draconitic lunar period, 5,458 months equals 5,923 lunar nodal periods, also appears a few times in Babylonian records. But the only such tablet explicitly dated is post-Hipparchus so the direction of transmission is not settled by the tablets. Hipparchus's draconitic lunar motion cannot be solved by the lunar four arguments that are sometimes proposed to explain his anomalistic motion. A solution that has produced the exact 5485923 ratio is rejected by most historians though it uses the only anciently attested method of determining such ratios, and it automatically delivers the ratio's four-digit numerator and denominator. Hipparchus initially used, Almagest 6.9, his 141 BCE eclipse with a Babylonian eclipse of 720 BCE to find the less accurate ratio 7160 synodic months equals 7770 draconitic months, simplified by him to 716 equals 777, through division by 10. He similarly found from the 345-year cycle the ratio 4,267 synodic months equals 4,573 anomalistic months and divided by 17 to obtain the standard ratio 251 synodic months equals 269 anomalistic months. If he sought a longer time base for this draconitic investigation he could use his same 141 BCE eclipse with a moonrise 1245 BCE eclipse from Babylon, an interval of 13,645 synodic months equals 148,807 12 draconitic months 14,623 12 anomalistic months. Dividing by 52 produces 5,458 synodic months equals 5,923 precisely. The obvious main objection is that the early eclipse is unattested though that is not surprising in itself and there is no consensus on whether Babylonian observations were recorded this remotely. Though Hipparchus's tables formally went back only to 747 BCE, 600 years before his era, the tables were actually good back to before the eclipse in question because as only recently noted their use in reverse is no more difficult than forwards. 
geometry, trigonometry, and other mathematical techniques. Hipparchus was recognized as the first mathematician known to have possessed a trigonometric table, which he needed when computing the eccentricity of the orbits of the Moon and Sunday. He tabulated values for the chord function, which gives the length of the chord for each angle. He did this for a circle with a circumference of 21,600 and a radius, rounded, of 3,438 units, this circle has a unit length of one arc minute along its perimeter. He tabulated the chords for angles with increments of 7.5 degrees. In modern terms, the chord of an angle equals the radius times twice the sine of half of the angle, i.e. chord, a, equals r, 2 sin, a2. He described the chord table in a work, now lost, called of lines inside a circle, by Theon of Alexandria in his 4th century commentary on the Almagest 1.10, some claim his table may have survived in astronomical treatises in India, for instance the Surya Siddhanta. Trigonometry was a significant innovation, because it allowed Greek astronomers to solve any triangle, and made it possible to make quantitative astronomical models and predictions using their preferred geometric techniques. For his chord table Hipparchus must have used a better approximation for pi than the one from Archimedes of between 3 plus 17 and 3 plus 1071, perhaps he had the one later used by Ptolemy, 3, 8 colon 30, sexagesimal, but it is not known if he computed an improved value himself. But some scholars do not believe Arayabhata's sin table has anything to do with Hipparchus's chord table which does not exist today. Some scholars do not agree with this hypothesis that Hipparchus constructed a chord table. Bo C. Klintberg states with mathematical reconstructions and philosophical arguments I show that Toomer's 1973 paper never contained any conclusive evidence for his claims that Hipparchus had a 34-38 based chord table, and that the Indians used that table to compute their sign tables. Recalculating Toomer's reconstructions with a 3600 radius and dash i.e. the radius of the chord table in Ptolemy's Almagest, expressed in minutes instead of degrees and in dash, generates Hipparchan-like ratios similar to those produced by a 3438 radius. It is therefore possible that the radius of Hipparchus's chord table was 3600, and that the Indians independently constructed their 3438 based sign table. Hipparchus could construct his chord table using the Pythagorean theorem and a theorem known to Archimedes. He also might have developed and used the theorem in plane geometry called Ptolemy's theorem, because it was proved by Ptolemy in his Almagest, 1.10, later elaborated on by Carnot. Hipparchus was the first to show that the stereographic projection is conformal, and that it transforms circles on the sphere that do not pass through the center of projection to circles on the plane. This was the basis for the astrolabe. Besides geometry, Hipparchus also used arithmetic techniques developed by the Chaldeans. He was one of the first Greek mathematicians to do this, and in this way expanded the techniques available to astronomers and geographers. There are several indications that Hipparchus knew spherical trigonometry, but the first surviving text of it is that of Menelaus of Alexandria in the first century, who on that basis is now commonly credited with its discovery. Previous to the finding of the proofs of Menelaus a century ago, Ptolemy was credited with the invention of spherical trigonometry. Ptolemy later used spherical trigonometry to compute things like the rising and setting points of the ecliptic, or to take account of the lunar parallax. Hipparchus may have used a globe for these tasks, reading values off coordinate grids drawn on it, or he may have made approximations from planar geometry, or perhaps used arithmetical approximations developed by the Chaldeans. He might have used spherical trigonometry. Aubrey Diller has shown that the clima calculations which Strabo preserved from Hipparchus were performed by spherical trigonometry with the sole accurate obliquity known to have been used by ancient astronomers, 23 degrees 40 minutes. All 13 clima figures agree with Diller's proposal. Further confirming his contention is the finding that the big errors in Hipparchus's longitude of Regulus and both longitudes of Spica agree to a few minutes in all three instances with a theory that he took the wrong sign for his correction for parallax when using eclipses for determining stars' positions. Lunar and Solar Theory Motion of the Moon 
Hipparchus also studied the motion of the Moon and confirmed the accurate values for two periods of its motion that Chaldean astronomers are widely presumed to have possessed before him, whatever their ultimate origin. The traditional value, from Babylonian system B, for the mean synodic month is 29 days, 31,50,8,20, sexagesimal, equals 29.530594,1. Days Expressed as 290AYS plus 12HOURS plus 7931080HOURS this value has been used later in the Hebrew calendar. The Chaldeans also knew that 251 synodic months 269 anomalistic months. Hipparchus used the multiple of this period by a factor of 17, because that interval is also an eclipse period, and is also close to an integer number of years. 4,267 moons, 4,573 anomalistic periods, 4,630.53 nodal periods, 4,611.98 lunar orbits, 344.996 years, 344.982 solar orbits, 126,007.003 days. 126,351.985 rotations. What was so exceptional and useful about the cycle was that all three 45 year interval eclipse pairs occur slightly over 126,007 days apart within a tight range of only about plus or minus 12 hour, guaranteeing, after division by 4,267, an estimate of the synodic month correct to one part in order of magnitude 10 million. The 345-year periodicity is why the ancients could conceive of a mean month and quantify it so accurately that it is even today correct to a fraction of a second of time. Hipparchus could confirm his computations by comparing eclipses from his own time, presumably January 27, 141 and November 26, 139 according to Tumor 1980, with eclipses from Babylonian records 345 years earlier. Already Albiruni and Copernicus noted that the period of 4,267 moons is actually about five minutes longer than the value for the eclipse period that Ptolemy attributes to Hipparchus. However, the timing methods of the Babylonians had an error of no less than eight minutes. Modern scholars agree that Hipparchus rounded the eclipse period to the nearest hour, and used it to confirm the validity of the traditional values rather than try to derive an improved value from his own observations. From modern ephemerides and taking account of the change in the length of the day, see delta t, we estimate that the error in the assumed length of the synodic month was less than 0.2 seconds in the 4th century and less than 0.1 seconds in Hipparchus's time. Orbit of the Moon It had been known for a long time that the motion of the Moon is not uniform, its speed varies. This is called its anomaly and it repeats with its own period, the anomalistic month. The Chaldeans took account of this arithmetically, and used a table giving the daily motion of the moon according to the date within a long period. The Greeks however preferred to think in geometrical models of the sky. Apollonius of Perga had at the end of the 3rd century proposed two models for lunar and planetary motion. Number in the first, the moon would move uniformly along a circle, but the earth would be eccentric, i.e., at some distance of the center of the circle. So the apparent angular speed of the moon, and its distance, would vary. Number the moon itself would move uniformly, with some mean motion in anomaly, on a secondary circular orbit, called an epicycle, that itself would move uniformly, with some mean motion in longitude, over the main circular orbit around the Earth, called deferent, see deferent and epicycle. Apollonius demonstrated that these two models were in fact mathematically equivalent. However, all this was theory and had not been put to practice. Hipparchus was the first astronomer we know attempted to determine the relative proportions and actual sizes of these orbits. Hipparchus devised a geometrical method to find the parameters from three positions of the Moon, at particular phases of its anomaly. In fact, he did this separately for the eccentric and the epicycle model. Ptolemy describes the details in the Almagest 4th.11. Hipparchus used two sets of three lunar eclipse observations, which he carefully selected to satisfy the requirements. 
the eccentric model he fitted to these eclipses from his Babylonian eclipse list, 22-23 December 383, 18-19 June 382, and 12-13 December 382. The epicycle model he fitted to lunar eclipse observations made in Alexandria at 22 September 201, March 19, 200, and September 11, 200. For the eccentric model, Hipparchus found for the ratio between the radius of the excenter and the distance between the center of the excenter and the center of the ecliptic, i.e., the observer on Earth 3144, 327 plus 23, and for the epicycle model, the ratio between the radius of the deferent and the epicycle, 3122 plus 12, 247 plus 12. The somewhat weird numbers are due to the cumbersome unit he used in his chord table according to one group of historians who explain their reconstructions. Inability to agree with these four numbers is partly due to some sloppy rounding and calculation errors by Hipparchus, for which Ptolemy criticized him, he himself made rounding errors too. A simpler alternate reconstruction agrees with all four numbers. Anyway, Hipparchus found inconsistent results, he later used the ratio of the epicycle model, 3122 plus 12, 247 plus 12, which is too small, 60, 4, 45 sexagesimal. Ptolemy established a ratio of 60, 5 plus 14. The maximum angular deviation producible by this geometry is the arcsin of 514 divided by 60, or about 5 degrees 1 minute, a figure that is sometimes therefore quoted as the equivalent of the Moon's equation of the center in the Hipparchan model. Apparent Motion of the Sun before Hipparchus, Meta, Yuktiman, and their pupils at Athens had made a solstice observation, i.e., timed the moment of the summer solstice, on June 27, 432, proleptic Julian calendar. Aristarchus of Samos is said to have done so in 280, and Hipparchus also had an observation by Archimedes. As shown in a 1991. In 158 BCE Hipparchus computed a very erroneous summer solstice from Callipus's calendar. He observed the summer solstice in 146 and 135 both to a few hours, but observations of the moment of equinox were simpler, and he made 20 during his lifetime. Ptolemy gives an extensive discussion of Hipparchus's work on the length of the year in the Almagest 3rd.1, and quotes many observations that Hipparchus made or used spanning 160-128. Of Hipparchus's 17 equinox observations made at Rhodes shows that the mean error in declination is positive 7 arc minutes, nearly agreeing with the sum of refraction by air and sword Lau's parallax. The random noise is 2 arc minutes or more nearly 1 arc minute if rounding is taken into account which approximately agrees with the sharpness of the eye. Ptolemy quotes an equinox timing by Hipparchus, at March 24, 146 at dawn, that differs by five hours from the observation made on Alexandria's large public equatorial ring that same day, at one hour before noon Hipparchus may have visited Alexandria but he did not make his equinox observations there, presumably he was on roads, at nearly the same geographical longitude. He could have used the equatorial ring of his armillary sphere or another equatorial ring for these observations, but Hipparchus and Ptolemy knew that observations with these instruments are sensitive to a precise alignment with the equator, so if he were restricted to an armillary, it would make more sense to use its meridian ring as a transit instrument. The problem with an equatorial ring, if an observer is naive enough to trust it very near dawn or dusk, is that atmospheric refraction lifts the sun significantly above the horizon, so for a northern hemisphere observer its apparent declination is too high which changes the observed time when the sun crosses the equator. Worse, the refraction decreases as the sun rises and increases as it sets, so it may appear to move in the wrong direction with respect to the equator in the course of the day as Ptolemy mentions. Ptolemy and Hipparchus apparently did not realize that refraction is the cause. However, such details have doubtful relation to the data of either man since there is no textual, scientific, or statistical ground for believing that their equinoxes were taken on an equatorial ring, which is useless for solstices in any case. 
not one of two centuries of mathematical investigations of their solar errors has claimed to have traced them to the effect of refraction on use of an equatorial ring. Ptolemy claims his solar observations were on a transit instrument set in the meridian. Recent expert translation and analysis by Antihan of Papyrus P. Fuad 267A has confirmed the 1991 finding cited above that Hipparchus obtained a summer solstice in 158 BCE. But the papyrus makes the date June 26, over a day earlier than the 1991 paper's conclusion for June 28. The earlier SEM found that Hipparchus did not adopt June 26 solstices until 146 BCE when he founded the orbit of the Sun which Ptolemy later adopted. Dovetailing these data suggests Hipparchus extrapolated the 158 BCE June 26 solstice from his 145 solstice 12 years later a procedure that would cause only minuscule error. The papyrus also confirmed that Hipparchus had used calipic solar motion in 158 BCE, a new finding in 1991 but not attested directly until P. Fuad 267a. Another table on the papyrus is perhaps for sidereal motion and a third table is for metanic tropical motion, using a previously unknown year of 365 14 1309 days. This was presumably found by dividing the 274 years from 432 to 158 BCE, into the corresponding interval of 100,077 days and 1434 hours between Meta's sunrise and Hipparchus's sunset solstices. At the end of his career, Hipparchus wrote a book called Peri Eniaujo Mejithus, On the Length of the Year, about his results. The established value for the tropical year, introduced by Callipus in or before 330 was 365 plus 14 days. Speculating a Babylonian origin for the Calipic year is hard to defend, since Babylon did not observe solstices thus the only extant system B year length was based on Greek solstices, see below. Hipparchus's equinox observations gave varying results, but he himself points out that the observation errors by himself and his predecessors may have been as large as 14 day. He used old solstice observations, and determined a difference of about one day in about 300 years. So he set the length of the tropical year to 365 plus 14 to 1300 days, equals 365.24666, days equals 365days5hours55 minutes, which differs from the actual value, modern estimate, including Earth spin acceleration in his time of about 365.2425 days, an error of about 6 minutes per year, an hour per decade, 10 hours per century. Between the solstice observation of Meta and his own, there were 297 years spanning 108,478 days. D. Rollins noted that this implies a tropical year of 365.24579. Days equals 365 days, 14,44,51, sexagesimal, equals 365 days plus 1,460 plus 44,602 plus 51,603, and that this exact year length has been found on one of the few Babylonian clay tablets which explicitly specifies the system B month. This is an indication that Hipparchus's work was known to Chaldeans. Another value for the year that is attributed to Hipparchus, by the astrologer Vettius Valens in the 1st century, is 365 plus 14 plus 1,288 days, equals 365.25347, days equals 365days6hours5 minutes, but this may be a corruption of another value attributed to a Babylonian source. 365 plus 14 plus 1144 days, equals 365.25694, days equals 365days6hours10 minutes. It is not clear if this would be a value for the sidereal year, actual value at his time, modern estimate, about 365.2565 days but the difference with Hipparchus's value for the tropical year is consistent with his rate of precession, see below. Orbit of the Sun Before Hipparchus, astronomers knew that the lengths of the seasons are not equal. 
Hipparchus made observations of equinox and solstice, and according to Ptolemy determined that spring, from spring equinox to summer solstice, lasted 94 one half days, and summer, from summer solstice to autumn equinox, 92 one half days. This is inconsistent with the premise of the sun moving around the earth in a circle at uniform speed. Hipparchus's solution was to place the earth not at the center of the sun's motion, but at some distance from the center. This model described the apparent motion of the sun fairly well. It is known today that the planets, including the earth, move in approximate ellipses around the sun, but this was not discovered until Johannes Kepler published his first two laws of planetary motion in 1609. The value for the eccentricity attributed to Hipparchus by Ptolemy is that the offset is 124 of the radius of the orbit, which is a little too large, and the direction of the apogee would be at longitude 65.5 degrees from the vernal equinox. Hipparchus may also have used other sets of observations, which would lead to different values. One of his two eclipse trio's solar longitudes are consistent with his having initially adopted inaccurate lengths for spring and summer of 95 3 4 and 91 1 4 days. His other triplet of solar positions is consistent with 94 1 4 and 92 1 half days, an improvement on the results, 94 1 half and 92 1 half days, attributed to Hipparchus by Ptolemy, which a few scholars still question the authorship of. Ptolemy made no change three centuries later, and expressed lengths for the autumn and winter seasons which were already implicit, as shown, e.g., by A. Eabo. Distance, parallax, size of the moon and the sun. Hipparchus also undertook to find the distances and sizes of the sun and the moon. He published his results in a work of two books called, On Sizes and Distances, by Pappus in his commentary on the Almagest 5th.11, Theon of Smyrna, 2nd century, mentions the work with the addition of the sun and moon. Hipparchus measured the apparent diameters of the sun and moon with his diopter. Like others before and after him, he found that the moon's size varies as it moves on its, eccentric, orbit, but he found no perceptible variation in the apparent diameter of the sunday. He found that at the mean distance of the moon, the sun and moon had the same apparent diameter, at that distance, the moon's diameter fits 650 times into the circle i.e., the mean apparent diameters are 360,650 equals 0 degrees 33 minutes 14 seconds. Like others before and after him, he also noticed that the moon has a noticeable parallax, i.e., that it appears displaced from its calculated position, compared to the sun or stars, and the difference is greater when closer to the horizon. He knew that this is because in the then current models the moon circles the center of the earth, but the observer is at the surface the moon, earth and observer form a triangle with a sharp angle that changes all the time. From the size of this parallax, the distance of the moon as measured in earth radii can be determined. For the sun however, there was no observable parallax, we now know that it is about 8.8, .8, several times smaller than the resolution of the unaided eye. In the first book, Hipparchus assumes that the parallax of the Sun is zero, as if it is at infinite distance. He then analyzed a solar eclipse, which Tumor, against the opinion of over a century of astronomers, presumes to be the eclipse of March 14, 190. It was total in the region of the Hellespont, and in his birthplace, Nicaea, at the time Tumor proposes the Romans were preparing for war with Antiochus III in the area, and the eclipse is mentioned by Livy in his Aburbi Condita Libri ATH.2. It was also observed in Alexandria, where the sun was reported to be obscured 4-5 THS by the moon. Alexandria and Nicaea are on the same meridian. Alexandria is at about 31 degrees north, and the region of the Hellespont about 40 degrees north. It has been contended that authors like Strabo and Ptolemy had fairly decent values for these geographical positions, so Hipparchus must have known them too. However, Strabo's Hipparchus-dependent latitudes for this region are at least one degree too high, and Ptolemy appears to copy them, placing Byzantium two degrees high in latitude. Hipparchus could draw a triangle formed by the two places and the moon, and from simple geometry was able to establish a distance of the moon, expressed in Earth radii. Because the eclipse occurred in the morning, 
the Moon was not in the meridian, and it has been proposed that as a consequence the distance found by Hipparchus was a lower limit. In any case, according to Pappas, Hipparchus found that the least distance is 71, from this eclipse, and the greatest 81 Earth radii. In the second book, Hipparchus starts from the opposite extreme assumption, he assigns a, minimum, distance to the Sun of 490 Earth radii. This would correspond to a parallax of 7, which is apparently the greatest parallax that Hipparchus thought would not be noticed, for comparison, the typical resolution of the human eye is about 2, Tycho Ubra made naked eye observation with an accuracy down to 1. In this case, the shadow of the Earth is a cone rather than a cylinder as under the first assumption. Hipparchus observed, at lunar eclipses, that at the mean distance of the Moon, the diameter of the shadow cone is 2 plus 1 half lunar diameters. That apparent diameter is, as he had observed, 360,650 degrees. With these values and simple geometry, Hipparchus could determine the mean distance, because it was computed for a minimum distance of the Sun, it is the maximum mean distance possible for the Moon. With his value for the eccentricity of the orbit, he could compute the least and greatest distances of the Moon too. According to Pappas, he found a least distance of 62, a mean of 67 plus 13, and consequently a greatest distance of 72 plus 23 Earth radii. With this method, as the parallax of the Sun decreases, i.e., its distance increases, the minimum limit for the mean distance is 59 Earth radii exactly the mean distance that Ptolemy later derived. Hipparchus thus had the problematic result that his minimum distance, from Book 1, was greater than his maximum mean distance, from Book 2. He was intellectually honest about this discrepancy, and probably realized that especially the first method is very sensitive to the accuracy of the observations and parameters. In fact, modern calculations show that the size of the 189 solar eclipse at Alexandria must have been closer to 910ths and not the reported 45ths, a fraction more closely matched by the degree of totality at Alexandria of eclipses occurring in 310 and 129 which were also nearly total in the Hellespont and are thought by many to be more likely possibilities for the eclipse Hipparchus used for his computations. Ptolemy later measured the lunar parallax directly, and used the second method of Hipparchus with lunar eclipses to compute the distance of the Sun. He criticizes Hipparchus for making contradictory assumptions, and obtaining conflicting results, but apparently he failed to understand Hipparchus's strategy to establish limits consistent with the observations, rather than a single value for the distance. His results were the best so far, the actual mean distance of the Moon is 60.3 Earth radii, within his limits from Hipparchus's second book. Theon of Smyrna wrote that according to Hipparchus, the Sun is 1880 times the size of the Earth and the Earth 27 times the size of the Moon, apparently this refers to volumes, not diameters. From the geometry of Book 2 it follows that the Sun is at 2550 Earth radii, and the mean distance of the Moon is 61 half radii. Similarly, Cleomedes quotes Hipparchus for the sizes of the Sun and Earth as 1050 colon 1, this leads to a mean lunar distance of 61 radii. Apparently Hipparchus later refined his computations, and derived accurate single values that he could use for predictions of solar eclipses. See Tumor 1974 for a more detailed discussion. Eclipses Pliny tells us that Hipparchus demonstrated that lunar eclipses can occur five months apart, and solar eclipses seven months, instead of the usual six months, and the sun can be hidden twice in thirty days, but is seen by different nations. Ptolemy discussed this a century later at length in Almagest 6th.6. The geometry, and the limits of the positions of Sun and Moon when a solar or lunar eclipse is possible, are explained in Almagest 6th.5. Hipparchus apparently made similar calculations. The result that two solar eclipses can occur one month apart is important, because this cannot be based on observations one is visible on the northern and the other on the southern hemisphere as Pliny indicates and the latter was inaccessible to the Greek. Prediction of a solar eclipse, i.e., exactly when and where it will be visible, requires a solid lunar theory and proper treatment of the lunar parallax. 
Hipparchus must have been the first to be able to do this. A rigorous treatment requires spherical trigonometry, thus those who remain certain that Hipparchus lacked it must speculate that he may have made do with planar approximations. He may have discussed these things in Peri T.S. Kata Plato's Niaas T.S. Selden's Kinses, On the Monthly Motion of the Moon in Latitude, a work mentioned in the Suda. Pliny also remarks that he also discovered for what exact reason, although the shadow causing the eclipse must from sunrise onward be below the earth, it happened once in the past that the moon was eclipsed in the west while both luminaries were visible above the earth, translation H. Rackham, 1938, Loeb Classical Library 330p.207. Tumor, 1980 argued that this must refer to the large total lunar eclipse of November 26, 139, when over a clean sea horizon as seen from Rhodes, the moon was eclipsed in the northwest just after the sun rose in the southeast. This would be the second eclipse of the 345-year interval that Hipparchus used to verify the traditional Babylonian periods, this puts a late date to the development of Hipparchus's lunar theory. We do not know what exact reason Hipparchus found for seeing the moon eclipsed while apparently it was not in exact opposition to the Sunday. Parallax lowers the altitude of the luminaries, refraction raises them, and from a high point of view the horizon is lowered. Astronomical Instruments and Astrometry Hipparchus and his predecessors used various instruments for astronomical calculations and observations, such as the gnomon, the astrolabe, and the armillary sphere. Hipparchus is credited with the invention or improvement of several astronomical instruments, which were used for a long time for naked eye observations. According to Sinsus of Ptolemy, 4th century, he made the first astrolabion, this may have been an armillary sphere, which Ptolemy however says he constructed, in Almagest 5th.1, or the predecessor of the planar instrument called astrolabe, also mentioned by Theon of Alexandria. With an astrolabe Hipparchus was the first to be able to measure the geographical latitude and time by observing fixed stars. Previously this was done at daytime by measuring the shadow cast by a gnomon, by recording the length of the longest day of the year or with the portable instrument known as a scaphi. Equatorial Ring of Hipparchus's Time Ptolemy mentions that he used a similar instrument as Hipparchus, called Dioptra, to measure the apparent diameter of the sun and moon. Pappus of Alexandria described it, in his commentary on the Almagest of that chapter, as did Proclus. It was a four foot rod with a scale, a siding hole at one end, and a wedge that could be moved along the rod to exactly obscure the disk of sun or moon. Hipparchus also observed solar equinoxes, which may be done with an equatorial ring, its shadow falls on itself when the sun is on the equator, i.e., in one of the equinoctial points on the ecliptic but the shadow falls above or below the opposite side of the ring when the sun is south or north of the equator. Ptolemy quotes a description by Hipparchus of an equatorial ring in Alexandria, a little further he describes two such instruments present in Alexandria in his own time. Hipparchus applied his knowledge of spherical angles to the problem of denoting locations on the Earth's surface. Before him a grid system had been used by Desirchus of Messana but Hipparchus was the first to apply mathematical rigor to the determination of the latitude and longitude of places on the earth. Hipparchus wrote a critique in three books on the work of the geographer Eratosthenes of Cyrene, 3rd century, called Pros ten Eratosthenes Geographian, against the geography of Eratosthenes. It is known to us from Strabo of Amasia, who in his turn criticized Hipparchus in his own Geographia. Hipparchus apparently made many detailed corrections to the locations and distances mentioned by Eratosthenes. It seems he did not introduce many improvements in methods, but he did propose a means to determine the geographical longitudes of different cities at lunar eclipses, Strabo Geographia January 1, 2012. A lunar eclipse is visible simultaneously on half of the Earth and the difference in longitude between places can be computed from the difference in local time when the eclipse is observed. His approach would give accurate results if it were correctly carried out but the limitations of time-keeping accuracy in his era made this method impractical. Star Catalogue Late in his career, possibly about 135, Hipparchus compiled his Star Catalogue, the original of which does not survive. 
he also constructed a celestial globe depicting the constellations, based on his observations. His interest in the fixed stars may have been inspired by the observation of a supernova, according to Pliny, or by his discovery of precession, according to Ptolemy, who says that Hipparchus could not reconcile his data with earlier observations made by Timocharis and Aristilus. For more information see Discovery of Precession. Previously, Eudacus of Nidus in the 4th century had described the stars and constellations in two books called Phenomena and Entropon. Aratus wrote a poem called Phenomena or Aritea based on Eudacus's work. Hipparchus wrote a commentary on the Aritea his only preserved work which contains many stellar positions and times for rising, culmination, and setting of the constellations, and these are likely to have been based on his own measurements. Hipparchus made his measurements with an armillary sphere, and obtained the positions of at least 850 stars. It is disputed which coordinate system, s, he used. Ptolemy's catalogue in the Almagest, which is derived from Hipparchus's catalogue, is given in ecliptic coordinates. However de Lambre in his Histoire de l'Astronomie Ancienne, 1817, concluded that Hipparchus knew and used the equatorial coordinate system, a conclusion challenged by Otto Neugebauer in his A History of Ancient Mathematical Astronomy, 1975. Hipparchus seems to have used a mix of ecliptic coordinates and equatorial coordinates, in his commentary on Eudoxos he provides star's polar distance, equivalent to the declination in the equatorial system, right ascension, equatorial, longitude, ecliptical, polar longitude, hybrid, but not celestial latitude. As with most of his work, Hipparchus's star catalogue was adopted and perhaps expanded by Ptolemy. De Lambre, in 1817, cast doubt on Ptolemy's work. It was disputed whether the star catalogue in the Almagest is due to Hipparchus, but 1976-2002 statistical and spatial analyses, by R. R. Newton, Dennis Rollins, Gerd Grasshoff, Keith Pickering, and Dennis Duke, have shown conclusively that the Almagest star catalogue is almost entirely Hipparchan. Ptolemy has even, since Bra, 1598, been accused by astronomers of fraud for stating, Syntaxis, Book 7, Chapter 4, that he observed all 1,025 stars, for almost every star he used Hipparchus's data and precessed it to his own epoch centuries later by adding 2 degrees 40 minutes to the longitude, using an erroneously small precession constant of 1 degree per century. In any case the work started by Hipparchus has had a lasting heritage, and was much later updated by Al-Sufi, 964, and Copernicus, 1543. Ulup Beg reobserved all the Hipparchus stars he could see from Samarkand in 1437 to about the same accuracy as Hipparchus's. The catalogue was superseded only in the late 16th century by Bra and Wilhelm IV of Kassel via superior ruled instruments and spherical trigonometry, which improved accuracy by an order of magnitude even before the invention of the telescope. Hipparchus is considered the greatest observational astronomer from classical antiquity until Bra. Stellar Magnitude Hipparchus ranks stars in six magnitude classes according to their brightness, he assigned the value of 1, today written 1,0 mag, to the 20 brightest stars, to fainter ones a value of 2, and so forth to the stars with a class of 6, 6 mag, which can be barely seen with the naked eye. That system is effectively still in use today though extended and made more precise through the introduction of a logarithmic scale by N. R. Pogson in 1856. Precession of the Equinoxes, 146-127 Hipparchus is generally recognized as discoverer of the precession of the equinoxes in 127. His two books on precession, On the Displacement of the Solstitial and Equinoctial Points and On the Length of the Year, are both mentioned in the Almagest of Claudius Ptolemy. According to Ptolemy, Hipparchus measured the longitude of Spica and Regulus and other bright stars. Comparing his measurements with data from his predecessors, Timocharis and Aristilus, he concluded that Spica had moved two degrees relative to the autumnal equinox. He also compared the lengths of the tropical year, the time it takes the sun to return to an equinox, 
and the sidereal year, the time it takes the sun to return to a fixed star, and found a slight discrepancy. Hipparchus concluded that the equinoxes were moving, precessing, through the zodiac, and that the rate of precession was not less than one degree in a century. Geography Hipparchus's treatise against the geography of Eratosthenes in three books is not preserved. Most of our knowledge of it comes from Strabo, according to whom Hipparchus thoroughly and often unfairly criticized Eratosthenes mainly for internal contradictions and inaccuracy in determining positions of geographical localities. Hipparchus insists that a geographic map must be based only on astronomical measurements of latitudes and longitudes and triangulation for finding unknown distances. In geographic theory and methods Hipparchus introduced three main innovations. He was the first to use the grade grid, to determine geographic latitude from star observations, and not only from the sun's altitude, a method known long before him and to suggest that geographic longitude could be determined by means of simultaneous observations of lunar eclipses in distant places. In the practical part of his work, the so-called Table of Climata, Hipparchus listed latitudes for several tens of localities. In particular, he improved Eratosthenes' values for the latitudes of Athens, Sicily and southern extremity of India. In calculating latitudes of Climata, Latitudes correlated with the length of the longest solstitial day, Hipparchus used an unexpectedly accurate value for the obliquity of the ecliptic, 23 degrees 40 minutes, the actual value in the second half of the second century was approximately 23 degrees 43 minutes, whereas all other ancient authors knew only a roughly rounded value 24 degrees, and even Ptolemy used a less accurate value, 23 degrees 51 minutes. Hipparchus opposed the view generally accepted in the Hellenistic period that the Atlantic and Indian Oceans and the Caspian Sea are parts of a single ocean. At the same time he extends the limits of the Oikumene, i.e. the inhabited part of the land, up to the equator and the Arctic Circle. Hipparchus' ideas found their reflection in the geography of Ptolemy. In essence, Ptolemy's work is an extended attempt to realize Hipparchus' vision of what geography ought to be. Legacy the rather cumbersome formal name for the ESA's Hipparchos Space Astrometry mission was High Precision Parallax Collecting Satellite, it was deliberately named in this way to give an acronym, Hipparchos, that echoed and commemorated the name of Hipparchus. The lunar crater Hipparchus and the asteroid 4000 Hipparchus are more directly named after him. Monument The Astronomer's Monument at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, California United States features a relief of Hipparchus as one of six of the greatest astronomers of all time and the only one from antiquity.